Good afternoon. Welcome to the United Nations. We are living in a very uh, challenging times, and um, it's a pleasure for the UNITER New Year Office to welcome all of you this afternoon. There are about 50 meetings just going at the same time in different rooms, and you'll feel the boss of the uh, United Nations. We wanted to do this event uh, in collaboration and, and uh, partnership with the uh, Foreign Policy Association, Mr. Noel Latif, a very dear friend of uh, UNITAR and the United Nations, in a better setting, in a better room, but this is what we, we got. But this is um, one of the most uh, remarkable rooms because presidents, ambassadors, ministers, and every single day a diplomat during the General Assembly working here in, this, in these settings. I call it the dent of diplomacy because that's where the brick layers comes to try to produce something for humankind, representing 193 states. So uh, humbly welcome to one of the working rooms of the United Nations. Uh, maybe many of you do not know, but there are others that already know. There are uh, ambassadors and, and they understand what I, what I mean. The uh, event that we uh, are proud to associate ourselves with the uh, Foreign Policy Association, the uh, tale of two pandemics, is of the utmost relevant for the uh, United Nations. While uh, today we may see the institutions under a, a very big uh, magnifier for what is happening in the world, um, there is a pamphlet over there of what the United Nations does. It's a, a pamphlet in blue. And it's a whole system in which take care of a lot of um, help around the world. Um, so uh, the history that uh, is going to be uh, disclosed to you today by this excellent group of panelists put it together by the Foreign Policy Association will go, I think I, I did my, a little bit of research to educate myself from the first pandemic to the last one and I put it in my notes and whatever was in between, because there is a lot of other things that are in between these two main, uh, main events. For the United Nations, just um, during the 77th session of the United Nations General Assembly, President Shaba Korosi uh, negotiated and appointed facilitators at a Basandoria level for eight uh, consultative process that yield uh, eight major uh, outcome documents from the United Nations, policy documents. Three of them are just related to the topic you are going to discuss today. This uh, declaration that were adopted at the beginning of the high-level week uh, 15 days ago was a political declaration of the General Assembly high-level meeting on pandemic prevention. That was the second document that the 78 session of the General Assembly adopted. The third document was political declaration on the high-level meeting on universal health coverage. And the third one was the political declaration of the high-level meeting of the fight against tuberculosis. So when I received the call from Foreign Policy Association on this topic, I was very pleased and very honored because it's embedded in the heart of the work of the United Nations and the General Assembly. And a lot of efforts has been made by member states, head of government, to achieve this kind of consensus in these areas. We are preparing for the end of the 78th session. President of the General Assembly, Ms. Denis Francis from Trinidad and Tobago, had already appointed two ambassadors to facilitate another outcome document in what we are calling uh, the uh, high-level meeting in 2024 on antimicrobial resistance. So uh, these are the work at the highest level of the United Nations on the topic that we are going to discuss, which is pandemics. With uh, that, I'm going to uh, welcome you uh, for this sake of time, I stop here. Uh, express my deepest uh, gratitude and recognition to the Foreign Policy Association, to Nola Chief, for trusting us in organizing. And finally, on a very administrative topic, uh, you see this mic and then you see a little uh, mouth trying to speak. When you press the button, you wanted to participate, you wanted to make a the mic will go green. 
then you wait. When it's red, you speak. It's the only place in which red lets you go and green stops you. Maybe you understand a little bit the United Nations. I don't understand yet the system. So welcome, enjoy Noel to you, and thank you very much for joining. It's red. It's red. Okay. Well, thank you, Ambassador Suazo. Uh, many thanks for your outstanding leadership of uh, UNITAR's office in New York uh, and for partnering with the Foreign Policy Association today. Uh, at the outset, I'd like to acknowledge our co-sponsors, Steve Brozak, managing partner and president at WBB Securities, uh, and Calvin Schmidt, senior vice president and worldwide leader for government affairs and policy at Johnson & Johnson, and a member of the board of the uh, Foreign Policy Association. I distinctly recall that Secretary uh, General uh, Antonio Guterres uh, characterized the COVID-19 pandemic as the greatest challenge to humanity since the Second World War. Uh, indeed, our senior fellow, Richard Hormatz, wrote in a special edition of Great Decisions, the flagship publication of the, of the Foreign Policy Association in April 2020, and I quote, the world is now engaged in what legitimately can be called the Third World War. It is not what strategists had imagined decades ago, no nuclear weapons, no missiles or destructive cyber technology, but massively lethal and devastating to economies and the lives of hundreds of millions of people nonetheless. And countries are not fighting one another, but a small, unseen, and unpredictable virus that poses a threat to virtually all governments, regardless of the, of the nature of their system or political philosophy. Tragically, the FPA was, a num was among a number of organizations in this country and around the world which warned that this could happen. In the 2000 issue of Foreign Policy Forum, I wrote, in a globalized world, the risks of the spread of contagion are not to be minimized. For those that doubt the potential threat it is important to remember that the year after the Foreign Policy Association was founded was marked by the influenza pandemic, which killed 20 million people worldwide, including 500,000 Americans, a greater death toll than all of World War I. I went on to say, FBA members take a keen interest in global health, and polls consistently show it is a topic that arouses interest. I believe that a grassroots approach to this issue could reap important dividends, not the least of which would be a reprioritizing of health issues in the formulation of US foreign policy. In 2010, the Foreign Policy Association launched its annual lecture series on global health issues. Our inaugural speech, a speaker, Dr. Anthony Fauci. Today, the convening of this panel is of great moment. Our distinguished panelists will plumb lessons from both the pandemic of 1889 and the COVID-19 pandemic. And I am pleased to announce a new prize endowed by our fellow, Dr. Steve Brozak with a monetary award of $100,000. Researchers from around the world are eligible to participate in a scientific inquiry into the pathogen that caused the 1889 pandemic. The prize will be awarded to the individual or individuals who define the scientific parameters necessary to identify the pathogen who provide a workable plan for achieving this goal and who accumulate data proving the identity of the pathogen that caused the 1889 pandemic. 
So having made this announcement, I am happy to turn to Dr. Richard Marfuji to introduce and moderate this afternoon's outstanding panel. Richard? You have to turn your there, you go. there we go. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Ambassador uh, Noel and distinguished panel, distinguished guests, thank you all for coming. I am Richard Marfuji, medical director of WBB's Research Institute, and will serve as your moderator. We've assembled a distinguished panel, and I'm honored to be in their company. Uh, a little bit of uh, housework. This uh, session is going to be recorded and edited and available for distribution after. And if you look in your welcome packet, you will have an index card. And should you, as we go along, have a question uh, for our panelists, uh, we will collect those. They'll be sent to me. And then, uh, time permitting, we will ask the uh, panel your question. Now, this presentation will be more than a history class. And no one need worry, there is no exam at the end. Um, it will be instead an exploration of the lessons learned and questions yet unanswered about pandemics with an eye to enhancing preparedness for the next global health crisis. Now, in 1889, there was an outbreak in Russia of what became known as the Russian flu. However, it posed little cause for concern here. Despite the fact that half the population of St. Petersburg, the Tsar of Russia, the King of Belgium, and the Emperor of Germany all contracted the disease. In fact, local newspapers uh, here concentrated on the health of all of these potentates, um, but assumed it was all going to stay over there. America saw no need to mount a political, public health, or medical response because, as I said, the afflicted were all over there. Even as the infection spread to Western Europe, the British Isles, that complacency persisted. <coughs> However, demands for treatment quickly overwhelmed the existing medical infrastructure. As depicted here in the red uh, little box, required erection of battleground type tents or compounds to shelter the sick and dying. Now, the necessity for emergency expansion of facilities may be familiar and reminiscent of recent scenes of tents and refrigeration trucks in hospital parking lots. In short order, the pandemic reached our shores and continued in waves through 1894. Okay? 1888-1894. Uh, spreading by rail and sea travel eventually to all corners of the earth. Despite its relatively low fatality rate, an estimated 50 to 100 million died, claiming disproportionately the young, the infirm, and the elderly. This was documented in 1892 by Dr. Jacques Bertillon, who published an article detailing the symptoms of Russian flu patients. Now see if these sound familiar. These symptoms included pneumonia, loss of smell, loss of taste, multiple organ failure, reinfection, and a host of neurologic abnormalities, which today might be called brain fog. He documented yearly re-emergences of the flu, which taxed not only the medical infrastructure, 
but also exerted extreme socioeconomic pressure. Until the advent of SARS-CoV-2, the coronavirus responsible for the COVID-19 infection, scientists assumed that the causative agent of the Russian influenza pandemic was a relative of the viruses identified for all influenza pandemics, including the Spanish flu of 1918. Publication of an article by noted scientists effectively halted consideration of an alternative to the theory that COVID-19 was a variant of the influenza virus. Coronaviruses come from wild reservoirs, such as bats, rodents, and birds. Infections usually begin with respiratory symptoms mimicking influenza. However, as in 1889, patients also suffered clinical peculiarities, such as multi-organ failure, persistent neurologic symptoms, and relapses. The assumption that an influenza virus caused the 1889 pandemic merits scrutiny because of the striking similarities to the COVID-19 pandemic in terms of the clinical, social, political, and economic. Now, we all know that sickness uh, in a family member affects more than the individual, it affects the whole family. In an analogous way, a pandemic affects not just the individual patient, it has actually global economic and social consequences. The 1889 pandemic hastened the collapse of major industries, spawned back bank failures, fomented political unrest, and even generated a popular Broadway play. Our first panelist reported on the effects of immune system imprinting, and he will talk a little bit about that, on patients who survived the 1889 infection only to succumb into the 1918 pandemic. The graph here shows mortality, which uncharacteristically targets people not at the extremes of life, but at the prime of their life. Our first panelist is Dr. Alain Gagnon, professor of demographics at the University of Montreal. Dr. Gagnon. Your research determined that the 1918 pandemic disproportionately claimed 28-year-olds instead of the expected young and old. What is the connection, if any, to 1889, and what do you mean when you say imprinting? Well, there's a lot of uh, very specific aspect, very interesting aspect about the 1918 pandemic. Uh, we talked about uh, 50 to 100 millions of deaths. Uh, where did it come from? And so there's a lot of um, research and lots of debates of, about that pandemics. To me, the most important thing, the most spectacular aspect of this pandemic, as we can see there, this is in Montreal, no relationship with me, although I'm from Montreal, uh, and Toronto. Uh, in October of 1918, at the height of the pandemic, and you also see uh, the mortality the number of deaths uh, during September of 1918 for the two cities. As you can clearly see, there's a very big peak at the exact age of 28 in 1918. And so when people are speaking of the fact that the, very young, uh, the young adults were much more, more, much more likely to die in 1918, this is true, but this, this is a bit misleading because the, this is construed as if it was an age effect if it was depending on age. But if you make the calculation, it's quite simple. Just subtract 28 from 1918, and you're at the end of 1889 or at the beginning of 1890. So that means that, in fact, what we're seeing here, it's a cohort effect. That is to say that the people who were born during the pandemic of 1889 or early 
1890 for the matter for many places around the world, um, were at a very high risk of death, and this concerned ages that are not usually targeted by the flu, because usually the flu will target older people. But at that time, in 1918, it was very young people. So the mechanism behind that, this is not for me to tell you. I'm a demographer, although I begin to know a little bit more uh, as, as the years go by about uh, immunology. But I have immunologist colleagues. Uh, what would be involved here is what we call antigenic imprinting, or um, as it was called before, the original antigenic sin. Now, this has nothing to do with religion, but that's how it was termed by uh, Dr. Francis in the 1950s, who noticed that the first infection in life uh, leaves an indelible imprint in the immune system for the rest of life. It's a bit like the first love, if you, if you wish. You will always remember that one, but the immune system will always remember uh, the, first, uh, the first infection in life. And so we, we begin, my colleagues and I believe that what's happening here is that uh, those people who were born during the 1890 pandemics had something, some infection, and the mechanism is not clear. I believe it was influenza, but we can talk about it. It could be also uh, coronavirus. It's very interesting to, to, fig, uh, to wonder if it's the case. But uh, that's the reason why they had higher mortality. And yeah, I guess I am. Thank you. Um, I think this may be the first time I've ever heard um, my love life being compared to a virus, <laughs> but I, it's certainly something that I will carry with me. Um, following up a bit, how, how does the study of past pandemics uh, advance under, understanding of our current pandemic or future ones or prepare us for the uh, next one? In short, why is it important that we're doing this? Because what happened back then could happen again. Uh, there could be, um, you know, for, the, for the, the young cohorts that were born around uh, 20, uh, 2020, um, could have that. They, they were, we know that they were not highly affected. Very young children or babies were not highly affected at that time. But we don't know what's going to happen um, in, in, in many years from now because of the fact that um, those type of viruses uh, leave those imprints uh, in the system. So they could be, we're talking about the COVID long, long COVID, but there could be a different uh, format in terms of uh, long COVID in the sense that people in, in the future who were born during that precise pandemic could be at higher risk um, in the future during another pandemic. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to turn to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Corinne Legoff. Okay. <laughs> I, I massacred her name, massacred her name before. Uh, is the current Chief Executive Officer and President of Immunon Corporation, and she previously worked with uh, at Moderna as a Chief Commercial Officer during the development of the mRNA vaccines that saved countless lives during the current pandemic. Uh, Dr. Lagoff, uh, mRNA vaccines have revolutionized pandemic care. What makes this technology so unique and valuable, and what are its limitations? You remember that uh, when the pandemic, you know, 2019, when we first heard of, of the pandemic, uh, it at that time started the fight for or, 20, or beginning of 2020, so January 10th of 2020, uh, the Chinese scientists were able to produce the sequence of the virus. And the NIH, the NIH, uh, just three days later, produced like the, what we call a seed vaccine. Right? And the development of the vaccine just took I would say two months later, it was already in clinical trials. So the NIH had an agreement with Moderna already because Moderna was, and I'll talk about the value of collaborations, uh, but Moderna was already collaborating with NIH on, on potential uh, uh, mRNA vaccines of different types. Uh, 
And very quickly, we were able to, to develop uh, a, a vaccine, which was really a way to save the world. I mean, you, you mentioned it, and I strongly believe it. Um, now, mRNA was a new technology. Right? Um, it is still a new, a new technology. It was perceived at the time as complete, being completely unknown. In fact, it had been, it's, we started talking about mRNA, which everybody knows now the biology of mRNA. Right? We started talking about it in the 90s. I mean, you've seen that two scientists, Dr. Weissman and, and uh, Conrad just got the uh, uh, recognized and, and obtained the, the Nobel Prize of, of Medicine for their work on mRNA because they were able to uh, transform the, the molecule so that it can become a therapeutics. Uh, but it took that many years right, to, uh, to, to develop mRNA as a therapeutic. So I, I do believe that what we have creating here with mRNA is the possibility for uh, your body, our body, to manufacture by itself the medicines it needs. Right? mRNA is a code, right? so it codes for, in, this, in the case of, a, of a, a vaccine, it codes for a protein that is present uh, uh, in the virus, and it teaches the, your body you know, to, uh, to recognize this protein as, as foreign. Right? So once you get infected, you already, already have, your immune system is already ready for attacking this, this pathogen. That's how it works. Um, but the beauty of it is that it can be developed super fast, like traditional vaccine development with traditional uh, technologies takes between six and 12 years, but we didn't have 12 years. Right? And, and if you remember back at the beginning of 2020, people were dying. Uh, I think we forget a lot, right, of what was the impact of this crisis before the, the vaccines were available. So we didn't have 12 years. So it took seven months to develop this, this, this vaccine. And, and it took a village, right, to make this happen. And, and notably, I will maybe come back and talk about the, what Operation Warp Speed has, has, has done, which was truly extraordinary. Um, so I think the key benefits of mRNA is speed. Uh, then it has other advantages if you think that it's a code that you can code for maybe a few pathogens at once, right? So you can try to think about potential for combinations. So, you know, resp respiratory infections is really a critical issue ar around the world. So you can, if you can get vaccinated all at once for flu, for COVID, for RSV, that's, that's great, right? So potential for, combina for combination I I is another one. And, and, and I think the, the other benefit is that, well, um, you know, it's, uh, you have here a tool that can be deployed in, in, in case of the next pandemic. Uh, so it's, I think all governments, um, you know, we're very interested in having a local production of mRNA uh, uh, so that they can be ready for, for the next pandemic because there will be an next pandemic, we, we know that. Right? Uh, and so mRNA will remain a very, very important tool to, to address pandemics in the future. Thank you very much. Um, now, but I understand now you've shifted your attention uh, to the development of DNA vaccines. What makes them better suited for uh, global administration? Well, so first, I would say that you know you cannot rely only on, on one technology, and that's one of the key learnings as well of the pandemics. And, and uh, the U.S. government in, in invested in in, in a f like three different technologies, right? At the end of the day, uh, mRNA was the one that was the most successful. But you cannot rely only on one technology, and it's very important to continue investing across the board in, in new innovations. Now, similarly to uh, to mRNA, DNA is a code. Right? In, in fact, it's uh, one step ahead of mRNA, right, in the in biology. So, DNA gets transducted into the nucleus of the cell and then uh, produces the mRNA, and then produces the protein. That's that's how it works. Um, why do we believe that DNA is interesting? Because um, contrary to mRNA, DNA is less fragile. Right? So, mRNA is a very fragile molecule. Uh, it has to be shipped at minus 70 degrees, very complex supply chain. You need to invest in, in cold chains. Very difficult to ship this product in, in hot countries. Right? And that was an issue during the deployment of, uh, of the vaccines. Um, 
within a year, you won't have this problem. This, 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 that would be a vaccine that would be stable uh, at room temperature for, for a while, uh, and you could store in a normal refrigerator. So that's, I think, in terms of if you think practically how you deploy you know, vaccination campaigns around the world, that's an, an extremely important point. But the, I think that the, the, you know, it has the same benefits in terms of speed, still a code, you can, and we demonstrated in our labs that you can produce a vaccine in 100 days, right? so in the same way. Uh, but what we believe would be important is that it also doesn't produce the same type of immunological profile. It's a bit broader. And with DNA, because mRNA is so fragile, it kind of peaks in your body and then disappears. 48 hours later, it's not there anymore. With DNA, it's still there and, and, and will prolong the expression of protein. So it gives your body simply the time to produce what we call memory cells. Right? And that's a good thing because while well, DNA has been super successful at producing mRNA, super successful at producing antibodies immediately, right? So it's the acute response, that's what you want, right, in, for, to, uh, against the pandemic. With DNA, you will avoid having to get revaccinated every three months, right? That's, that's simply not possible. Right? And we see that today, right? I think, you know, we're deploying now uh, uh, new uh, uh, vaccines for the, uh, the, the new variants, but people will not go back to the pharmacy every six months to get another booster, right? That's not going to happen. So in the endemic time, you really want a vaccine that could be administered at the minimum once a year. Uh, and that's what we're trying to develop. Yeah. Um, thank you. The um, international cooperation in mRNA development was pretty astounding. Um, and I'm wondering how you envision fostering that co sense of cooperation and improvement in the years to come. Switching off my mic, but yeah, I, I think it's, um, it was really unprecedented. Uh, and the public-private partnership for, for me was key here. Uh, Operation Warp Seed was a true success, if not for the ability to deploy uh, resources from the DOD, from HSS, from, you know, every part of, of, uh, of the administration, we would not have been, it wouldn't have been possible to produce this, this vaccine, right? Uh, and, and we've learned a lot. Um, and, and, and also, I want to say, right, the investments that the U.S. government made. Right? Now, you know, in, in contrast with... Uh, I believe it was two trillion dollars that was given for pandemic relief, right? The investment made in the development of vaccine is just a drop in the ocean, right, in comparison. Um, but still, you know, it, it was necessary for companies like ours to be able to ramp up manufacturing at scale, at commercial scale. Uh, they would have, it would have been absolutely impossible. Uh, so thanks to warp speed and the ability for the FDA to uh, to uh, give an, uh, an approval for those vaccines, emer emergency use authorization, you know, without cutting corners, right? So still, you know, putting on the market a safe uh, product, that, that was just extraordinary. So that's, that's the, key, the key learning for me. Um, I, uh, along that line, just picking up on that, one of the uh, questions has to do with the globalization of by definition, pandemics. It doesn't, pandemics don't just end up in wealthy countries. And what, if anything, do you think might be done to facilitate uh, maybe manufacture and distribution in other countries that aren't as, uh, you know, uh, advanced in resources as, say, the United States? Yeah, that's, the, the question of, of equity and access is, is really central. And, you know, for a global pandemic, you need a global response. Um, aside from the distribution complexities of, of mRNA, uh, you know, there, there is certainly uh, learnings here as well. Uh, I think, you know, um, the Western countries procured the vaccines very early on. And if you look at the statistics, people were uh, living in 
European Union or other Western countries, uh, got vaccinated 20 times faster than people in other regions, right? And actually, they got boosted before some other countries received their first dose. Right? So that's uh, problematic. Uh, now, there were donations made by those countries of, of, of doses. Uh, Gavi was, was efficient as well in distributing to low and, and middle income countries. Um, but what we need is, is a s global network of countries that will make sure that there is, you know, the, the me first mindset doesn't prevail, right? It's, I think it's very important for, for all pandemics because keep in mind that with COVID-19, although it was a disaster for the economies, we, we, you know, and many lives lost, but we were lucky. We are lucky because it's a coronavirus. We have the experience of other coronaviruses. Actually, there are you know, s seven uh, coronaviruses that are known to be pathogenic for, for humans. Uh, not all of them are that pathogenic, but at least you know, we know MERS, right? The mortality rate for MERS is 50, 30%, right? So COVID, in contrast, is you know, one to 2%, right? So imagine if we had had a pandemic of COVID-19 with the mortality of MERS. That would have been a very, very different situation. And we should be ready for this as well. So anything we can do to you know, increase surveillance of, uh, of uh, you know, viruses and you know, monitoring of uh, waste waters, all those things, you know, we need to invest in that. Uh, the medical ethicist in me is most concerned with equity and distribution of uh, resources, and especially when it comes to uh, pandemics, because a pandemic could care less whether you're a potentate or a average citizen, whether you are wealthy or whether you are poor. And uh, we need to understand, I think, the idea that until we have access for everyone, uh, all of us are going to remain at risk. Um, now, changing topics yet again. Uh, Dr. Stin van Neuerberg is the Earl W. Katz and Benjamin Shore Professor of Real Estate at Columbia Business School. Now you're going to wonder why in the world do we have a real estate uh, expert on our panel. His research interest is on the economic impact of working from home, which we all know uh, was spawned largely or in, in, uh, accelerated largely by the recent pandemic. And he concentrates on the effects in the sectors of real estate and public finance. Um, Dr. Van Newberg, you write about economic scarring caused by the COVID-19 pandemic and highlight the increase in government debt. But the U.S. has run a deficit for the last 15 years. What makes today's situation any different? Thank you uh, very much for having me. Before we talk about work from home, let's talk about uh, debt and about uh, uh, your, your first question. Right, so it's important for us to sort of think back to 2020. In 2020, the world economy suffered a shock, the likes of which we haven't seen at the very least since the Great Depression. Right, in the United States, for example, unemployment skyrocketed from 4.7% to 14%. 20 million people lost their jobs. GDP growth was neg negative 7.5%. Again, a number that we had not seen since the Great Depression. So a shock of that magnitude, also the stock market fell, bond market spread skyrocketed. It was financial mayhem. A shock of that magnitude, I think, created what, something that economists have called belief scarring, where basically, you know, it creates such a large shock that it's, and, and it's, it's an observation that was not in our economic data set before, or at least hadn't been for a very, very long time that it affected people's 
uh, beliefs about what's possible, you know, how, how negative the shock could be to the economy. So economists call this belief scarring and sort of the economic equivalent of the imprinting that Dr. Uh, Gagnon was talking about earlier, right? Now, the response to that economic shock was sort of as severe as the shock itself. It was, you know, best compared to, uh, you know, the patient was in cardiac arrest and we needed something unprecedented. And, you know, both on the monetary policy and on the fiscal policy uh, side, there was massive intervention. Interest rates were slashed. Uh, central banks all over the world bought trillions of dollars of treasuries. Uh, on the fiscal side, as, as you mentioned, we spend in the United States alone over $2 trillion in pandemic aid. Same story in many European countries, same story all over the world, really, right? Now, what that has done is it has sort of temporarily boosted, it has sort of recovered, and the unemployment rate recovered surprisingly quickly, uh, it, GDP growth recovered, but it has shouldered society with a lot of debt, okay? In the United States, for example, debt has tripled uh, from 2007 to today, you know, from roughly 30% of GDP to 120% of GDP today. And it's not just in the United States, it's true all over the world. Levels of public debt are higher than they have ever been sort of collectively in the world economy. Right? And so this, this amount of debt, you know, one way of thinking about that is you know, there was a lot of private debt that, that the government and that the taxpayer in the world has taken on. And this will be an economic legacy that we will need to struggle with for the foreseeable future because the debt will not pay itself back. We will have to service it. And now that interest rates are much higher, the cost of servicing that debt will be much more meaningful. How, how long is it possible for us to maintain a debt that's larger than our GDP? That just doesn't sound like one could survive very long. Well, I mean, I would say that um, there's a, let me give you a, uh, a, a, a simple answer. If you look at world history, um, the, we had sort of global economic dominance by the, the Dutch Republic in the 17th century, by the UK in the 18th and 19th century, and then by the United States since, let's call it Bretton Woods, since the 1920s. The hegemony, the economic hegemony passed from one of these countries to the next when debt to GDP reached levels around 200, 250% of GDP, roughly speaking. So, as a practical matter, as a historical matter, there seems to be a bound on how high debt can go before the economy and, in fact, society starts to weaken to the point that it can no longer maintain its, its, position, its primal position in the, world, in the world economic hierarchy. Right? So the United States is not, that, it's not there yet, but certainly sort of the levels of indebtedness that we have seen uh, are, are sort of slowly taking on alarming proportions. Especially now that this was one, it was one thing when the interest rate was 1% or 2%. Now that the interest rate is 5%, uh, we, you know, the, the cost of servicing that debt has doubled or tripled. And so it will become a, a lot more of a salient issue to the, to the public. I think that's a fascinating thing to consider. Um, Especially, I found your concerns about so-called surprise inflation. And I don't know how many of us realize how much uh, private debt has been transferred. And uh, in large part, as you said, to pandemic-related fiscal stimulus. How did that happen? What does that mean, and how did that happen? So in the United States, for example, and again, in many countries, the, the story was very similar. Uh, there were large uh, fiscal programs that bailed out uh, either the, 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 the corporate sector. In fact, in the United States, um, for the first time in history, really, the Federal Reserve Bank uh, put in place corporate credit facilities. Uh, the largest program was the, the PPP, um, which was essentially uh, you know, grants to, to small businesses, allegedly to pay for payroll, but in really, it was sort of forgivable debt. Um, and um, you know, companies took this up. It was a very expensive program. Um, many of those companies, with hindsight, we now know probably did not need that bailout. Some of them, no doubt, did. Um, but it was a very costly program, and it was sort of a direct way of subsidizing the private sector uh, you know, by, by taxpayers. And again, I think 
the more we learn about this and the more we study this program, the clearer it becomes that there was definitely this was def this program could definitely have been run much more efficiently. Um, so that's sort of one example, and I think there, are, you know, in the, you know, in the financial crisis a few a decade before, uh, the banks got massive bailouts. In this crisis, banks got a lot of bailouts through the back door, through central banks, uh, in particular, ultra low ultra low monetary policy. Um, so I think there's sort of a, a myriad of ways uh, in which uh, you know private debt has gotten has gotten publicized. Uh, you concentrate uh, by analyzing real estate, commercial and private. Uh, I think many of us are aware New York, like many other urban centers, has a commercial real estate vacancy rate. Here in New York, I believe it's approaching 23 um, percent. What is this? What effect is this going to have on any notion of recovery? Absolutely. So as you mentioned, I spent a lot of the last few years thinking about the impacts of remote work on uh, the real estate sector. And, and many of you will remember, and again, this is not just a U.S. phenomenon. This happened all over the world. A lot of folks, when the pandemic first hit, uh, you know, fled urban centers because urban centers were sort of associated mm -hmm. with a faster mm -hmm. spread of disease. Uh, that a lot of people went to, sub to suburban areas, sort of outside of the urban core. Uh, there was a massive demand for, for homes, for new homes, for apartments. It caused a, sub, a suburban housing boom. In fact, house prices have gone up 45% over the, in the two years from when the pandemic first hit until two years later, until March 2022. That's probably the largest two-year house price increase in American history. Uh, and a lot of that was induced by the pandemic. Right, so we sort of had this migration out of urban centers towards the suburb, and and house prices in the, house price rises in those places. Alongside with that, we had sort of a lot fewer people coming into to their offices. If we look today, three years, three and a half years after the pandemic, physical office occupancy in New York City is 50% of pre-pandemic levels. Okay, so you know when you swipe your badge when you get into your office building, we can count those swipes and we can count that there's 50% office occupancy levels relative to pre-pandemic. That obviously means that there's substantially less demand for office and that the values of those office assets have fallen substantially. My research suggests that in New York City, for example, the value of the office stock is down 40%. Okay, so which is a large number, and that means that you know both investors in the equity and in the debt in these office properties will will suffer substantial losses. A lot of these losses are now beginning to get realized because it takes a while for that distress to materialize, uh, and I think we're still in the early innings of this commercial real estate um, unraveling that we will see. Uh, this is problematic not only because you know of the uh, the landlords who own those buildings, but also because a lot of banks have lent against these, these office buildings. A lot of these banks are the same banks that got into trouble in March when Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank failed in the United States. Uh, a lot of these are regional banks that do, that do regional commercial real estate lending. That's really the bread and butter of commercial banking. And so, you know, the, the, banking, the banking crisis, there's, in my mind, it is quite likely that we'll see another chapter of this banking turmoil as more of these commercial real estate loans need to be refinanced. That, that's what I was just going to ask about, was um, eventually uh, leases expire and need to be renegotiated, and uh, cities depend upon taxation from these buildings. Uh, what do you see happening to uh, services? So now we're not so much talking about landlords as opposed to simple residents of these areas. That's right. So, you know, give you another number. New York, since we're in New York City, New York City gets about 15% of its overall tax revenue from property taxes on commercial buildings, office and retail in particular. So if those, and ultimately that tax revenue will be tied to the value of these buildings. So if the value of these buildings falls 40% in the, in the medium run, tax revenues will fall 40%. For New York City, that would mean about a five to $6 billion hole in a $100 billion budget. So five or 6% deficit, which is non-trivial. And because local governments have to balance their budgets, they would need to make this up either by taxing households and businesses more or by cutting spending, which Sorry. means government services, which means less money for transportation, less money for education, less money for sanitation. 
We already have a rat problem in New York City, right? <laughs> uh, less money for public safety, right? All of these things will make the quality of life in the city worse and will result in some people deciding that they want to move out. The 10 largest metropolitan divisions in the United States have already lost 2 million people in the last three years. So this out-migration is happening. It's mostly the higher income folks that, that leave first. They are responsible for a disproportionate share of income tax. And so as those people leave, economic activity weakens, property values fall further, sales tax revenues fall further, uh, you know, service cuts accelerate, tax increases, more people leave. And so this is a dynamic I have called the urban doom loop. Um, this is something that happened in, in New York City in the 70s. It's also something that happened in Detroit. It's happening in other parts of the world. Uh, but it's, it's a worry, the sort of the fiscal, the local fiscal implications of the, of the remote work revolution. Um, is it possible for that trajectory to be altered, or is it inevitable? I don't think it's inevitable. I think it, it's, it's not invariant to policy. I think uh, both at the local and at the federal level, there's an, a range of things you can do. I think the fundamental problem is that there's too much office that ultimately will need to be converted into alternative use. At some level, cities have always reinvented themselves over the ages. Uh, this is not unlike the deindustrialization that happened in the 50s and the 60s in, in, in many Western cities. And eventually offices came in their place and offices were the solution. Now offices are the problem. <laughs> and we will need to find something else for these office buildings to turn into. But that takes time, it takes effort, and it sometimes takes a nudge from the government, whether it be relaxation of zoning rules or other regulations or potentially financial subsidies. Federal governments could also help. I'm thinking, for example, about the Inflation Reduction Act in the United States that could help subsidize some of the uh, green aspects of that transformation. Thank you. That's a great segue, um, because our next speaker knows about nudging the government. Um, Dr. Gregory Wauro is professor of political science at Columbia University. Uh, specializing in political methodology and American politics. Uh, Dr. Waro, yours is one of the timeliest of professions today. The uh, U.S. Congress is, among its duties, responsible for raising and appropriating money. However, a leaderless House cannot function. How does the Congress of today compare to that of 1893? Uh, so the Congress of today is very different from the Congress that existed in the 1890s, although I would say the institutional changes that happened in the 1890s put the Congress on its, on its current path um, to what, what we have today in terms of a, uh, a House of Representatives that is largely a majoritarian body and a United States Senate that is decidedly non-majoritarian. Um, the what's interesting about this this period um, is it's a it's a period of of intense control by party leaders, and so uh, particularly in 1890, uh, we might say that the the speakership in the House was at the height of its power. Uh, there's a very uh, expert parliamentarian in this in the speaker's chair, uh, Thomas Brackett Reed. Um, at this time, um, implemented what's referred to as the Reed Rules, uh, where basically what the Reed Rules did was they essentially tamped out minority obstructionism. So we normally think of filibusters in the United States as being a creature of the Senate, uh, but they were quite common in the House of Representatives at this time. Um, the adoption of the Reed Rules, um, much to the protest of the minority party Democrats at that time, eliminated pretty much any significant minority influence. It became a majoritarian institution. Um, and I would argue that the Reed rules and the institutional context that stemmed from them created a, a more functional chamber. Um, it was a chamber that was racked by dysfunction in many, on many occasions during the late 19th century. Um, so much so that when the Democrats took back power a couple years later um, in, in the House of Representatives, they repealed the Reed rules, but then reinstated them <laughs> shortly thereafter because they realized that in order to have the institution run, be functional, accomplish its 
fundamental tasks like raising revenue and, 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 and spending revenue. Um, it needed more parliamentary control by the central leadership. And so uh, that set the, 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 the House of Representatives on, a, on its current majoritarian path. Um, that said, about 20 years later in 1910, there was a revolt against the speaker. Um, at that time, Joe Cannon was in the chair. And uh, it's very similar to what we see is happening today. We, have, we had a Republican party that was plagued by factionalism. And the result was a revolt against the speaker that dramatically undercut the powers of the speaker. The speaker still maintained a, a, a relative central position in the institution, but not at the same height as it was during the, during the Reed era. Uh, there we go. <laughs> Are you able to compare, or is there a comparison between the so-called political machines of uh, the 19th century and the 21st century. Uh, yeah, so I think this is relevant to the question of government capacity in dealing with a health crisis like what happened in 1890, 1889 versus what happened more recently with the COVID pandemic. Um, back then, we had a very different institutional environment. Um, at the federal level, we basically had what we call a patronage state, um, where the federal government was not involved very much in public health policies. It wasn't involved in many of the areas of policy that the federal government is involved in today. Um, at the local level, it was um, machine dominated. Um, at the local and state level, it was Democratic Party machines, Republican Party machines based on the spoil system. You won office, you kept office by providing tangible benefits, by distributing goodies. Pork barrel politics ruled the day. Um, and so you, you didn't have an institutional environment that really, or, or you know, a kind of government uh, institutional infrastructure that you would need in order to address a major, uh, a major public health crisis. So there's really no comparison between how what the government looked like back then and what it looked like today, although in recent conversations with some members here today, um, you know, the, my Columbia colleague brought up PPP, and maybe there are some comparisons between <laughs> how the federal government used the, the tariff revenue that it raised, the tremendous amounts of tariff revenue that it ra raised back then uh, to distribute to different political machines and supporters. Maybe there is a connection between what happened with the, uh, the, the federal government's response to the COVID-19 pandemic and how um, uh, federal dollars were distributed uh, in ways that might have influenced uh, political outcomes. <laughs> um, do you think the Congress has learned anything from the uh, COVID pandemic in going forward? Uh, that, that's a very good question. Um, I would say yes and no. Uh, what, one of the remarkable things I think about the, um, about the government's response to the COVID-19 pandemic is we are at a period of, of heightened polarization. Uh, in fact, uh, 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 an intriguing parallel between the political economic landscape now and that of the, of the, uh, of the late 19th century is we are at comparable levels of political polarization in terms of mm -hmm. Democrats on one side, Republicans on the other side, and very little bipartisanship happening. It happens occasionally, um, and it happened in response to the global pandemic. If you look throughout American history, the way that significant legislation in response to crises gets passed is with broad bipartisan majorities, which many of us would think that seems impossible nowadays. Um, that was not impossible for the pandemic, and I think we're lucky, very lucky for it in terms of the way uh, Democrats and Republicans uh, came together, especially given the administration at the time, which was not known for compromise. Um, they, the, their ability to come together, pass policies that prevented perhaps much worse outcomes in terms of uh, public health, in terms of number of people who, who died and got sick because of the pandemic, um, and, the, and the economic fallout from the, from the pandemic. Um, so what is happening currently in the House of Representatives raises questions about what lessons individuals in the House, who were, many of whom were still in the, were in the chamber back when, the, when broad bipartisan legislation was passed in response to the pandemic, uh, in terms of what it means to compromise. And 
if you have a leader of the chamber um, who is still very powerful by many measures, um, who will forge compromise, bipartisan compromise, to do things like raise the debt ceiling um, or fulfill Congress's fundamental duty of passing appropriations bills, that that person won't be punished for forging those kinds of coalitions when m members of their own party will not, will not provide the votes that you need um, with a very narrow majority in order to even get to 218 votes, which is what you need in the House of Representatives to pass legislation. Um, so I think with the, uh, the vacating of the, of, of the, of the chair um, and the ousting of Kevin McCarthy, um, I wonder, so it's, it seems like there are certainly some members who did not learn that lesson and will probably never learn that lesson. Um, you get, we could assign various motives for why they, they did what they did. Um, I suspect there, uh, there, there's more going on there or, you know, or maybe even something more base than we, than we might think. Um, my sense right now, I hesitate to make a prediction given we are in very uncharted waters at the moment, um, but where, see, where things seem to be going now and you really do have to follow it on you know, a minute by minute basis, <laughs> I was reluctant to say anything about this before I checked my, my news feed before I came in here because uh, who knows what could have happened between the time I left Morningside Heights and the time I got, <laughs> I got down here. Uh, but it seems like there, there is movement toward more of a compromise candidate to elect somebody who will be able to do the basic day-to-day -day things that the leadership in the House of Representatives has to do to make it a, you know, a minimally functional body in order to accomplish its fundamental tasks. Thank you. Um, turning now to Dr. Steve Brozak, who is the president of WBB Securities and the founder of WBB Securities and the founder of the WBB Research Institute. Um, it is due primarily to his strong convictions that 1889 holds critical keys to improving pandemic preparedness that we are here today. So, Dr. Brozak, what prompted you to begin the project? Um, thank you, Dr. Marfuji. Um, when I uh, got out of the Marine Corps the first time, back in 1986, um, I came to work in the life sciences space in the capital markets. <clears throat> and over those 37 years, that includes 1987, 1993, 1995, 01, and 08, there have been crises but I would have to say that, um, to make a long story short, this unfortunately by far seems the worst in terms of what to expect next. Now, that's mighty bold talk and we've had the doom loop and we've had other negative uh, uh, pronouncements here, but um, I can remember back in 08 when we saw a systemic collapse, but that was a collapse that was to some degree self-engineered but it was engineered by people who were looking at comparators, differentials in payments on mortgages, collateralized debt obligations, um, credit default swaps. But what they were looking at were the wrong comparators. They were looking at performance based on situations that they thought could never happen or never bothered to look and ask, what would the extremes do in this particular case? So, we had been involved in the problematic pathogen space since H5N1, and we started to look at what were the comparators, what were the real issues. And the true discovery we made wasn't that, oh, well, you've got to focus on this specific virus or what we're looking at. You had to focus on the big picture, what we like to call a, a true Odyssean approach, where you would look at the entirety of the picture, which is why we have assembled these people and another 10 to talk about what are the different aspects we should be thinking of, not just about this pandemic, but vis-a-vis -vis other pandemics that have taken place. Richard, could you switch over to the 1918-20, uh, uh, 19 pandemic slide? That, uh, you just passed it. When we look at the, no, the, you just passed it, the one I keep going. No, the other way. Go on the wrong way. Sorry. Yeah. There. 
When Jeffrey Taubenberger went out there and exhumed bodies from an Inuit village to find the H1N1 pathogen, it wasn't really that bad a pathogen. I mean, it was, it killed people, but there were other issues around there. And it was also an influenza pathogen. So at the end of the day, was the preamble the wrong preamble? Were we looking at something that was bad, devastating, could teach us, but did it teach us the right lessons? And again, when we look at the right lessons, go to the 1893 three slide. You just had it. I'm sorry. There you go. I'm going to give you a little click. Thank you. <laughs> this was actually a play on Broadway because obviously Broadway or Hollywood, they can't be, uh, you know, bested in terms of their spectacular uh, statements. This came out in 1896. And the one problem that we saw within our firm and as an analyst was that the pressure, the sustained pressure over years, not a couple, is the problem. We're always at a crisis, in a war, doing whatever. But typically, you don't see continuous, sustained pressure. When a boiler explodes, it doesn't explode because one rivet is loose. It explodes because a series of rivets have come loose over continued pressure. What if 1889, which continued to 1894, was an example of the pandemic we are looking at today? What if? we're talking about the sustained pressure, whether that be in the real estate area, whether that be in politics, whether that be dealing with imprinting that takes place based on a disease that trains the body to do one thing. What happens? What do you look at for what happens next? Now, scientists, believe it or not, are the most unscientific people in that they expect things, okay? And the true, um, the, the true discoveries, the aha moments that I've seen, and I've pretty much been involved in every major financial healthcare discovery in the last 30 years, either one, directly or one step removed, were always counterintuitive. They weren't because of the system, they were in spite of the system. mRNA in its early days was discounted, but there were people in government that went out there and said, we're gonna put money into this, well before it was necessary. And the things about the short-lived nature of mRNA, are, it's, not a, it's not a drawback. It's an asset if you look at you wanted something short-term. Whereas with DNA, it's an asset that lasts long-term. So when you start to look at this overall picture, then it prompts you to think, well, what if? What if, like in 08, we didn't understand what the issues would be for mortgage defaults above four, five, six, seven percent. When Professor Nuremberg basically said, um, what if we're dealing with a long bond at five and we have problems, what happens if the long bond goes to six, seven, or God forbid, eight? What does that do? Then do we start to hit that 200 percent of GDP? That's the reason we're here today, to kick off, okay, how do we prove this? We don't have the... Uh, the shoulders to do a research um, approach that's a global one. However, in every major discovery that I've seen, it wasn't done for money. It was done because some researcher, that woman or that man, refused to take no for an answer when they understood they had something that was different. And what we're looking for is a researcher somewhere in the world to say, we can prove or disprove whatever the case may be, that the virus that was in 1889 was a coronavirus. And if that's the case, then we have to start to think about what will happen next if one of our central tenants is different. How do we go out there and start to advise people to know about what should our next move be, understanding it isn't just a healthcare issue. It's a global socioeconomic issue that will keep um, will keep us in a position that we don't want to be. And at the end of the day, how do we not react to it, but how do we anticipate what happens next? The crash of 1893 prompted the depression of 1893. Roughly 20% unemployment in the United States, 15,000 um, 
companies went bankrupt. You know, the proverbial bread lines. Uh, the, the banks that went bankrupt literally started people thinking about what they needed to do with creating a Federal Reserve, because that crash wasn't resolved by the federal government. It was resolved by J.P. Morgan, the J.P. Morgan, in going out there and saying to different banks they had to put up money to prevent the insolvency of the system. These are the kinds of considerations we need to think about, and that's why we've launched this prize to go out there and say, what if? And if that's the case, what do we do next so that we're not reacting to the situation? So, are you so you're saying then these things could change the trajectory that we're heading on? I'm saying that by anticipating the boiler explosion, by going out there and reinforcing the rivets, by going out there and understanding that we have to be prepared for a situation that could be far more problematic than we think. I mean, the expression now everyone's familiar with it is, you know, we're through with COVID, but COVID is not through with us. Well, what if in its, in its ferocity, it continues in the same path? How much pressure will that put, not just on us, but on the entirety of the globe? And what are those ramifications that we really need to think about right now? Um, we have a question uh, from our audience, and it's a more a philosophic one. Uh, why do uh, we seem less willing to prepare for pandemics than we are to uh, muster military force? I'll leave that to anybody here. All right, having, having served, uh, <laughs> one is a esoteric situation that, it's no longer esoteric, but the other one is tangible. When you prepare for a pandemic, well, how often do they happen, according to most people? On the military side, unfortunately, they're dual use, let's say. Um, they can be used for just about anything. And at the end of the day, um, it is one of those situations where it is easily accountable. Uh, and we're looking at a world that I believe part of the pressure from this pandemic is it made it much more unstable. So it's sort of like a um, cycle that uh, is a self-fulfilling one. Um, we have a question uh, for Dr. Legoff. Um, you're a CEO. Um, why continue investigating in new technologies? Don't we have enough? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, you know, in, in, Innovation is, is key, and we've seen this w w with mRNA. I mean, people think that mRNA has been developed in a couple of years, but in fact, it was 20 years into the making. Uh, so it takes time uh, to develop what's coming next, and it needs, it takes time, uh, investment, foresight, vision. Um, so there is an absolute necessity to uh, continue investing in, in new technologies, because we, do not know, right? There is a, uh, I mean, what we know for, for, for sure is that um, in the world of infectious diseases, uh, viruses will continue to jump from animal reservoir to humans. Right? And will do more so because of global warming, because of urbanization. Uh, so we know this for sure. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a solid trend. Right? And not preparing for it and not investing in, in new technologies to address these uh, both threats is actually, uh, you know, it's not questionable. I mean, there's an absolute need for, for more investments. And I think we are doing that. Right? There we go. Um, one of the things that seems characteristic of the United States and many in science is it's uh, not sexy to uh, engage in prevention of anything, to prepare for things. Rather, we want to um, rescue 
We want to run in after the building has fallen down to look for bodies instead of uh, shoring up the building. Do you have any ideas how that might be altered going forward, particularly getting across the notion that it's important to prevent or anticipate at least preparedness for a pandemic? Well, if we're looking at history, uh, one thing is sure is that as soon as a pandemic is over, people just don't want to think about it. It just comes, goes out of the memory. There's a famous book written about the 1918 pandemic, and the subtitle is The For Forgotten Pandemic. And you'd think that people should have remembered what happened. Uh, and it was the same in 1968. There were people interviewed the Hong Kong pandemic. Of course, it was not that bad, but I think it killed like 30,000 people uh, in France in 1969 or something, or 1970. Well, that was after 1968, people were thinking about something else. But it's, uh, uh, th there was a, a program on the radio and the animator could not even remember that there was a pandemic that year. So, um, and I intervened in a conference once and I was asked, will we forget about that one? And it all depends, in fact, about uh, what will be the co long-term consequences <laughs> Um, I guess people will not forget as fast as before, but I think uh, we already forgot it in some way. People don't want to think about this. It's not really sexy, yet, as you said. Could I just ask our host, since we are at the United Nations, uh, whether the United Nations sees this as an opportunity to shore up its role uh, in terms of a more robust multilateralism and a way to uh, really bring the importance to the forefront of uh, international cooperation, because this is certainly the, the, the best example of where we need international cooperation. I know we also have your spouse here, the permanent representative of Monaco, and maybe we could ask Ambassador Pico to weigh in as well. <laughs> well, thank you very much. It was very instructive. Sure. I don't know if I am uh, more frightened now than <laughs> before. <laughs> well, the fact is that when we, I, I still remember vividly uh, the spring of 2020 when the World Bank had to bid on behalf of developing countries because they, they didn't have the capacity. So this was very frightening. And when you see the data, you know, it's only 22% of uh, developing countries' uh, uh, population that have been vaccinated against 75 for the developed world. Uh, so as you said, uh, Dr. Le Goff, um, the problem with uh, mRNA vaccine is the difficulties to, to maintain their stability, etc. So I'm very happy to hear about new development. But, I, um, you know, when uh, it was the first uh, political declaration that we adopted on uh, um, um, pandemic preparedness, it was not an easy negotiation. And as you say, it's like people have already forgotten, you know, and, and this is where uh, Dr. Brozak, I, I'm even more frightened because it seems that it's, it's like a, a cycle that is ready to hit us again. And... Uh, um, you know, WHO, of course, is at the forefront. But here, uh, how could we frame what do you see as the most important for you, for the private sector, for, for people who do research, to focus on when we need uh, political momentum? Uh, because here it's very broad, you know. So, so we need to find something that will unite us all and not as only on, on the north part of, of, the, of the world where, where we have the capacity, where we have uh, uh, health systems that are sustainable. On the opposite, the few uh, health systems that they had are, are in the developing south, totally destroyed. So we, we cannot keep losing that, you know, because we all, it looks like we're always going backward and we're trying to catch up. So what I would like from, from uh, some guidance, you know, because uh, it was very instructive and I wish that uh, all my colleagues were there to really understand the facts. And uh, so f for, for us, you know, this is what I, I would like to, some guidance. What could we do better on the political aspect to help you? Okay. 
That's, uh, that's the most cogent uh, question I've heard in a long time. Um, it's simple. The way we've approached healthcare has been we spend inordinate sums on therapies that may or may not work for end stage diseases that at the end of the day are just not practical globally. Right now, the single largest beneficiary in the companies we deal with, the largest, look at diagnostics, not PCR diagnostics that take forever and not antigen tests that are reliable sometimes, but next generation diagnostics, multiplex diagnostics that can go out there and tell you in under a minute what the disease you've got is, whether it be respiratory, whether it be um, you know, from saliva, and at the end of the day, can tell you within one minute with PCR sensitivity, the technology exists, that can go out there and tell you exactly what you have so that it's actionable information. That's what we need right now. And there are programs. Gates is, you know, looked at the periphery. Um, but at the end of the day, um, between, let's say, four or five different uh, NGOs, they've gone out there and they've said, we're putting the challenges in the large companies that you're seeing. They're being annihilated by the loss of COVID diagnostic revenue. Have to think this thing out. And the other part is a little bit different. This virus changes too quickly for a vaccine strategy to be effective. There's just no way. We now have to focus on those people who are the most vulnerable, those people who have comorbidities, the type 2 diabetics, those people who are morbidly obese, those people who have non-operating immune systems. And by going out there and finding a therapeutic that can rescue these people before they go into significant harm's way, that's the, that's the real answer. Because at the end of the day, not all people ha who have COVID are going to be in the same situation. The science also exists. As a matter of fact, I believe in the next month, um, a trial system called Just Breathe will be announced by BARDA, the division of HHS, where they're going to look at candidates for clinical trials dealing with specifically this issue. Now, the problem has been these types of testings have been controversial, you know, with things like hydroxychloroquine thrown in, you know, by people who are like, you know, where did this come from? It has spoiled, despoiled the landscape. The idea is, if you really want to address the issue, this is the answer. And at the end of the day, we should understand more about the science in dealing with that and in understanding therapeutics for other indications that are just as problematic and for others that are going to be coming down the pike. I think you're going to have the last word, Marco. Okay. Is that okay? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. No, I, agree. Yeah. Okay. I agree. I am right now. Thank you very much. Um, I, I was following your presentation, Dr. Posa, and, and I was um, um, thinking about the uh, element of the pressure you were, you were mentioning at the beginning. And I was starting to see, because I have a chart, when I mentioned us between the 18, uh, 19 and, and the COVID, and I said something like, and whatever is in between. And whatever is in between is a series of pandemics that happened very uh, focalized in a specific period of time that came actually uh, in the last period of time almost every three years, the last one, Ebola, for example, uh, before that. Uh, so uh, she got COVID twice already. I didn't. Uh, my son got the previous one before, before COVID. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that pressure uh, 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 is, is real. And, so, and, the, and the other element that I wanted to add is that uh, yes, the, the World Organization at the forefront, but uh, here we are talking about a bigger problem, which is the problem of, of resources, and I was mentioned here, the political will to do something, to invest in preparedness and in not being reactive. If we don't have the leadership of the bigger uh, uh, countries on this, imagine the global south that doesn't have resources even for food, how they can prepare. Uh, and doing so. So there is this uh, always uh, dystopia in, in, in the United Nations, for example, in which they are the ones to have and the ones to doesn't have. So the, the, the big challenge is, is that we are trying to adopt policies, global policies that help and are inclusive to everyone. 
and I am talking about the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, this declaration, as I will mention, one was very difficult to uh, accommodate language that may be inclusive to all of us. Uh, and this uh, new uh, process, the high-level meeting for 2024 on the antimicrobial resistance, have two ambassadors to go into deal at the political level in the United Nations. And Dr. Uh, Brosek, I will be very, very honored if you can entertain the possibility to talk to them, to express to them in a very private setting and just to uh, let them know, because there is a lot of consciousness that has to be developed between the private sector, the investment companies of uh, this uh, sector, uh, the political sector uh, um, in this area. That's what we helped, I guess, was what Isabel was uh, trying to also to, to convey. We have to come together as a civil, as a humanity to solve this crisis. AMR is probably the greatest crisis we face as a globe, period. It's, there's no second, third, or fourth at the end of the day. Um, it is the natural order when we've just bombarded bacteria um, and other pathogens with antimicrobials without any diagnostic to tell us what we're doing. Um, I think that we could have several conferences talking about what have been the answers. And that kind of pressure, by the way, is also part of COVID. Um, Dr. Marfuji was the lead author in a paper that we had published in the Journal of Infectious Disease earlier this year that stated that COVID leads to sepsis. And there is no equivocation about that. Another paper followed up, and we're working with the um, National Institutes of Health on a demographic study that's going to show how it does it. But at the end of the day, unfortunately, the pressure that all of these speakers here have talked about and the idea behind what we're facing isn't one thing. It's uh, a group of things that we can't just play human whack-a-mole with. So happy to, happy to talk about that. I'm sure every person here will have a, have a specific story about the person sitting next to you suffered from sepsis based on an antimicrobial resistant bug. And at the end of the day, you know, it's something that will happen to either us or one of our loved ones. So it's, it's interrelated. Uh, please join me in thanking our very distinguished panel, Steve Brozak, Alain Gagnon, Corinne Legoff, Richard Marfuji, Sten Van Neuverberg, and Gregory Warrell. Thank you very much.